What I'm going to be talking about is all in a unified theme. It's all in uh, source and filter characteristics. So I'm going to talk to you about what those are and then how it applies to, to both speech and musical things. Before I do that, I want to end up telling you a little bit about the types of things that I do. This is my general area. My background's in uh, psychophysics, which uh, I consider to be like the psychology before there was psychology. Right, it's the, uh, a lot of the methods that were the foundation for the first laboratory v uh, that's credited to Wundt. Were, uh, all of his training was kind of based on psychophysicists. Uh, he worked with a guy, uh, some of you may know, uh, von Helmholtz, who was responsible for the first uh, uh, authoritative texts on uh, auditory sensation. Uh, and then, uh, and, and musical basis for that. And then, uh, uh, later, later on, he was also training, like borrowing methods from Gustav Fechner, who's the father of, of modern uh, psychophysics. So, uh, so it's old school. You're going to have to end up suffering, right? But, it, but it's an old school way of thinking. And uh, specifically, I apply that to a little bit about speech, a little bit about music. Uh, specifically looking, I'm usually classified as an instrument timbre guy, which like I'm interested in how people recognize sound sources, musical sound sources. Uh, more specific things, looking at, uh, I'm interested in stuff having to do with event categorization, uh, perceptual organization, will get as much as scene analysis where you're trying to end up uh, organizing things in a more complex listening environment. Uh, that borderlines on attention work and, and that takes me into kind of feature integration territory. So I've kind of published in these different areas. I'm not going to be talking about all of them today. I put that out there though. If you want to end up talking about some of that stuff with me, please, you have my contact information, please follow up with me. Uh, more specific stuff that, uh, that I'm looking at, I, I mentioned instrument timbre, uh, musical instruments, environmental noises too, uh, prosody, so uh, we've been doing some studies looking at vocal cues to detection of deception in the voice, uh, and then also looking at, at phoneme perception, I'll give you a hint of that stuff today. All right, so what is this talk? I can't give a talk without disclaimers, so I'll end up saying what it is and then what it isn't. What it is, uh, it probably should have shoved some other word like different or atypical or additional uh, uh, contributions of source and filter. These are things that have been known for a while, but the things I'm going to be talking about are kind of additional things that people didn't really add on or consider, okay? Uh, and this is also a combination of different things that I've done in the past uh, to try to end up kind of building a more general theoretical argument. You'll tell me at the end whether that worked or not, but it's basically a bunch of snippets from, from previous talks that are all held together by kind of one strand. Some of it's going to be from music, particularly at the beginning, and then I'll end up putting in some speech-related stuff uh, later on. What it's not is complete, right? So, so I can't obviously just string together a whole bunch of conference presentations. We'd be here for a couple of days, right? Uh, don't, don't want to end up doing that to you. Uh, so I'll be abbreviating the methods and talking about some of these areas. Please feel free and comfortable to end up asking me if something's not coming across as a result of that quick synopsis. Uh, it's also not representative of everything I'm doing, so, so if, if you have ask, uh, questions about any of those aspects, feel free to follow up with me. And it's not brief, uh, you know, yeah, I only talked as long as we have time for, but uh, Mike, you know me from, from giving talks before. I've never been accused of being brief in my language anyway, uh, so, so it fills up the time. But the problem is here uh, that, that this talk, by combining a lot of different ideas together into one unified theoretical thing, makes it larger, right? So uh, uh, it's, I should also end up saying it's not well practiced, right? This, this talk, uh, nobody else has heard this talk but you guys. I saved it just for you, right? Um, and, uh, and it's not well practiced to the level of like, heck, the talk didn't even fully exist until like about a half an hour ago because we were still losing some slides, right? So, so, uh, so we compressed it down to size. You'll tell me how well it works, and feel free to ask me questions along the way so that everybody makes sense of it. All right. So the unifying theme and claim that's hanging all this stuff together has to do with uh, a source and a uh, filter. Uh, but what is that, and what is, what is the focus? I'm really saying that uh, we as listeners are frequency specific in the way we go about things. That there's going to be particular regions of the spectrum that we're going to end up concentrating on. Uh, the prediction from that is that if, if we kind of evolved to be able to end up uh, focusing on particular regions of the spectrum and, and uh, get details from that, then across domains, whether we're talking about speech, music, environmental noises, that should end up guiding the recognition of a bunch of our sound sources. 
Um, and that comes from the source filter model of, of uh, speech and sound production. So it's developed in speech, but it really applies to a bunch of other stuff too. So what is that thing? Uh, boils it down to kind of two steps. You have a, a source, typically they're talking in speech about a source of vibration, the vocal folds, you know, show on the left, we can end up blasting air through past your vocal folds and they're gonna end up uh, vibrating as you continue to end up forcing air through there. Uh, so you got cycles of vibration from that. That's gonna create a basic uh, harmonic series, a bunch of integer multiples of, of a low frequency, okay? Uh, then, on the right-hand side, you've got what constitutes your filter. It's by manipulating all the articulators that you have control over uh, in your speech system, uh, that's the vocal tract, the series of tubes we're shoving air through, we're gonna modify their size and shape in order to be able to end up creating whatever speech sounds we're interested in. So there really is no speech without the contribution of the filter, right? The filter, the second stage where we're modifying the shape and size of what we're passing air through, that's what's going to end up determining ultimately what we hear as speech, okay? But the same sort of uh, characteristics are gonna guide some of uh, our interest in musical sounds and environment, uh, environmental sounds as well. Uh, so we're interested in not just the filter, but like the interaction between these two things and what that might do to our ability to recognize the sound. Uh, the effect of the filter then in, in creating speech is that we start with a source spectrum on the left, that, that would be the harmonic series uh, of frequencies shown by these vertical lines, each one is a separate harmonic. And uh, what's produced at the vocal folds is something akin to uh, a sawtooth wave. It falls off at about six decibels an octave, okay? And it should sound like a buzz to you, okay? And then um, on the right-hand side is going to end up being the resultant spectrum after we've passed this sound through a series of, of filters, right? The, the vocal tract is going to end up having Sever, several offshoots around constrictions in that tract, and each one of them is gonna have its own resonant frequency that's gonna uh, let stuff pass through there very easily at those frequencies. In the valley sections here, that stuff is going to be attenuated and not come through as strong. So the resultant spectrum is gonna reflect that, and so this should end up sounding more like a vowel as a result of these peaks in the spectrum coming out. Uh. Okay? So uh, what's shown here is now apply that to the production of, of different vowels as an example. So we have uh, E at the top and ah at the bottom, and you can end up seeing it's chopping up this, this uh, series of tubes of the vocal tract in different ways. Uh, the result is going to end up being completely different peaks in the spectrum show, shown in this kind of uh, middle set of graphs here. Uh, with E, they're rather diffuse for the first couple of peaks that you see, and for A, they're rather compressed, okay? Uh, if we do this for all vowels in American English, you get the pattern that's kind of showed between those first two peaks in the spectrum, shown as F1 and F2 on the right-hand side, and you get this distribution that's essentially being determined by uh, your tongue position, front and back in the mouth on one axis, and your tongue height, how high or low it is in the mouth on the other axis. Turns out those two peaks in the spectrum are enough to be able to end up determining what the vowels are in, in your language. Uh, we refer to these narrow bands of energy that are particularly uh, uh, intense across frequencies as formants. And so I'll be using that term throughout. You'll see either F1 to talk about the lowest formant in frequency or F2 the next higher formant. So these will be kind of concentrated areas of energy that are particularly intense. That's what we're going to be focusing on. Okay, the first example I'm gonna provide you of, of this source filter stuff uh, coming out uh, uh, comes from work I did with Jim Beauchamp, and it has to end up doing with like, what are the core things that define a musical instrument sound? Gets to what is timbre, okay? This is the standard definition, textbook definition that, that people who do music uh, perception research have had to live with. That attribute of auditory sensation in terms of which a listener can judge that two sounds similarly presented and having the same loudness and pitch are dissimilar. What do you guys think of that definition? How many, by show of hands, like that definition? Don't raise your hands all at once, okay? That's a relatively small percentage of you. Why should we be bothered by this definition? Does it tell you what it is? Yeah, it is word salad. It's, 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 it's a little bit of hocus pocus. So like, I have no idea what this stuff is, but I can tell you what it's not. It's not that stuff. It's a definition by exclusion. 
Okay? So I would say that's not a definition at all. Right? We need to end up knowing what, what the parameters are that people are actually using. Thankfully, some people have done some research in this area, uh, and uh, we know at least some things about it. One of the things that we found out is from uh, what they call multidimensional scaling work. This is work where they'd present a whole distribution of sounds in pairs, and they'd say, judge how similar these sounds are to you. It's an estimate of kind of how perceptually close two things are together. Okay? If we take all the results from these ratings that people give and throw them to a computer program to end up making a simplified map of that, we end up getting an idea of like there are several kind of axes, each of which are showing something perceptually important about the signal that we have to go back and figure out what that is. Um, over on the right hand side is a picture of such a solution uh, coming from uh, McAdams et al. And this, uh, this solution is actually showing three different uh, axes or dimensions each of which reflects some sort of perceptual attribute the listener is using. We usually take that back and look at what acoustic characteristic is associated with it or correlated with it. And when they did that, they get these three that are shown on the left-hand side. Uh, spectral centroid. The centroid is basically where is the center of the energy with respect to frequency. Okay? We have a whole distribution of, of uh, intensities across the frequency range. Where is the center of that whole distribution? Uh, you can end up thinking of this perceptually as the perception of how bright something sounds to you. I know I'm using visual metaphors. I hate that we do that. But that's the way they typically talk about it. It's how much high frequency content do you have in the stuff that you're listening to. Okay? Uh, ever notice that somebody on the telephone sounds a little bit different than they do in person? That's brightness, right? Um, the telephone is actually sampling at, at a, a lower sampling rate that gets rid of all the frequencies above 4,000 hertz. Right? So you're hearing the low to middle frequencies of what they produce. It's a little duller sounding than when you're talking to them in person, a little less bright. Okay? Another uh, dimension here is a temporal parameter, time-based parameter, and that's uh, rise time, specifically the logarithm of the rise time. That's how long from the beginning of a tone to where the intense portion is reached. A piano has an instant attack, right? a hammer hits a string, 10 milliseconds later you've got a really intense portion of the tone. Okay. A violin that's being bowed, however, you could end up waiting 400 milliseconds before you reach the most intense portion of the tone, so drastically different. Okay. And then both parameters, like spectral temporal parameters, this is called spectral flux. We could look at the distribution of energy across frequencies and look at how much does it change over time. For certain sounds, like when you're bowing a violin, it's very dynamic and there's a lot of change moment to moment. Whereas other sounds, like a piano striking a string, the job is done. Right now it's just decaying out. And so you don't get the same level of flux coming from that. Okay, so these were the three parameters they thought were driving all of uh, instrument timbre for the last quarter of a century. Okay. They also ended up looking at other tasks like discrimination. Can you tell the difference between two things? Uh, and uh, oftentimes you can end up using that to end up seeing like if we simplified the tones that were given and you found that uh, uh, people could end up discriminating things better uh, when something was removed, you must have pulled out something that was relevant to identifying the instrument. Okay? Uh, so discriminability or being able to tell the difference between two sounds depends upon kind of whether these parameters actually contribute heavily. So they, they've done a lot of kind of alterating signals and see what people can tell the difference between. Um, and then other spectral temporal par parameters beyond the ones that I've listed here have been identified by Jim in other work. So I just wanted to end up mentioning that if you're interested. Uh, okay. So what about just asking people, though, what the heck is the instrument they heard? I'm amazed in psychology research how long it takes people to figure out that maybe if we have a question of, like, what is this thing, why don't we ask the question, what is this thing? We were talking about that last night with some stuff, right? Uh, this uh, quote from McAdams actually highlights that. It says that uh, just asking people to identify the instrument sounds that they're hearing uh, could be really useful in determining like whether it actually is going to end up contributing beyond the levels of whether it's discriminable or not. So we could be talking about the difference between discriminating something, contributing to the naturalness of a sound, whereas your identification ability tells you whether it's actually changed categories to something else. So what tells us that that sounds like a piano? What tells us that your voice sounds like you? Right? 
In order to do that, we have to ask people to identify it. So I, uh, our interest was in actually doing a study where we were combining some of these techniques. So we used discrimination and identification, and we looked at the relative salience of some of the characteristics that I've spoken about. Uh, the spectral envelope uh, is going to end up relating to the centroid idea, but I'll, I'll distinguish it from it. Um, spectral envelope is the whole shape of the distribution of energy across frequency. Spectral centroid is just an acoustic measure of like where's the center of the distribution at, right? So they should be related, but they're definitely not the same. Uh, and then we also looked at rise time differences. Okay, here are the simple stimuli that we came up with. Most psychoacousticians will end up reducing things down to really simple situations, and this is no different. Took the first 500 milliseconds of a couple of uh, different tones, uh, samples from a violin and a trombone, uh, and what you're looking at in the top in green is uh, the pattern across the waveform of just the increase in energy overall. This will end up depicting the rise time. What you should be able to see is for the violin in the upper left hand side, it's very gradual over those 500 milliseconds. Whereas uh, for the trombone, it's a little more instantaneous. It's not instant. It's not like a piano. Okay? It's a difference of a few hundred milliseconds, and that's shown down in the table. Uh, additionally, I've got some information there about the centroid, uh, and that differs slightly across those two instruments as well. So we've got uh, multiple characteristics that are going to end up being different. The bottom, where it has F1 through F6, these are spectral peaks that were measured for the tones we were working with, and that's going to define the spectral envelope shape that I'm talking about. Essentially, the fact that the trombone and uh, the violin showed completely different patterns of energy should end up contributing to being able to end up uh, recognizing the instruments. The transforms that you see in the middle columns are actually things that we systematically remade these tones then, sucking out all the other sources of variation that could exist, and we're creating kind of intermediate steps on these dimensions. If it contributes, we should end up seeing systematic changes in performance as we play around with these things. Uh, the reason, if you're looking down at the frequency numbers at the bottom, that they don't look to be equal, equally sized, they're not equal sized in hertz, they're equal sized in what are called uh, MEL steps. This is a scale that represents how we actually go about perceiving frequency. So we'd say in frequency discrimination capability terms, these steps are equivalent in size. Okay? Um, we, this is a computer controlled uh, operation and, uh, and we had a total of 16 tones. Uh, first task was just to end up identifying what they were. Since there are only two instruments, it makes it pretty easy, right? They can end up just telling us if it's a string or a brass sound. And, uh, and we familiarized them with these sounds, at least the endpoints, before we began. But there are lots of hybrids in between. Um, all right, I'll let you hear what it sounds like. It's not going to sound like a beautiful violin because all the other sources of variation that could contribute are gone. Can people tell like that's the beginning of a string sound at least, synthetic though it is? Okay, contrast that with this in the other corner which would be the original kind of resynthesized trombone. Slightly muted, but you can end up telling a different characteristic, okay? Now, what about the hybrids, right? This is actually combining now the spectral envelope of uh, the trombone with the rise time of the violin in this corner. Brass or string, what was it? Was it more like the first or the second thing I played you? More like brass, okay? And so this one, you can probably guess what's going to happen. More like string, right? Um, so you can, you can already tell what the results of the experiment are before we've even presented them. Um, but bottom line is, which of these parameters then should con contribute heavily? Which were you following? The spectral envelope, the spectral parameter, or the temporal parameter, the rise time? It's the spectral parameter, the frequency-based parameter was what was responsible for your judgments there. Okay? Um, we also did a discrimination task where we now varied uh, uh, what they were comparing with one of these standards in the corners, uh, either by one step, two steps, or three steps, along either one dimension, the spectral envelope dimension, or alternatively the rise time dimension, which is uh, being shown kind of in the vertical here, or along the diagonal, which is both dimensions varying simultaneously. This will end up telling us how much each of them is contributing 
to performance. Here's what it looked like for discrimination performance. Uh, the uh, red and the yellow represent something where the spectral dimension, this envelope shape, could contribute. That includes the formants. Okay. And the measure you're looking at, D prime, this is a theoretically bias-free uh, measure of sensitivity that, that uh, psychophysicists use. The higher it is, the better you're doing at discriminating. If it goes to about like 4.64, 4.65, that's essentially perfect performance, folks. Basically means they're discriminating every trial. Look where it's sitting, right? Right around 4.65. So it basically means any time we played around with the shape of, of this spectrum, which formants were present, that determined how they were going to respond. The other one that is shown in purple there is the temporal dimension of rise time. And uh, did it contribute? A little bit, but only like it showed an increase when we went to kind of three steps removed along the continuum. So it's really not contributing very heavily at all. So even though these are two of the three things that people said could have been contributing to the perception of the timbre, one of them clearly is the important one. Okay? Um, right, and that just reiterates everything I just told you. So we're going to end up uh, telling you about identification now. Uh, if we ask them to identify what the instruments were, again, it shows that they're following what's happening in the spectrum or frequency information, not what's happening so much in the amplitude information. So the amplitude information is shown in the legend as the different colored bars. And if you look for any one along the spectral dimension, you can end up seeing the height of those bars is just about the same. Okay? So like at violin, for example, yeah, there's a lot of variability there, but there's really not any statistically significant change uh, coming uh, from the amplitude information. Uh, same on the trombone end, where they're, uh, like for violin responses, they're basically bottomed out. Okay? So what are they using? They're using uh, formant structure, where, where the energy is across the spectrum. So how do we resolve this about rise time if rise time was supposed to be one of the three major contributors? It turns out that if you look back at the literature, you can end up finding out that there's some suggestions that rise time really boils down to a much simpler characteristic for us perceptually that wasn't really well represented in the study, despite the fact there are hundreds of milliseconds of rise time difference. Uh, what you're looking at are kind of two MDS solutions where the dimensions that, that are, are being compared here or that I'm going across, one vertically over on this side and horizontally in this other study, uh, have to end up doing with rise time. What you see is clusters of instruments all pulled together in two pools, one on one side, one on the other side, and nothing in between. Everybody see that kind of big gap in the middle, regardless of which picture we're looking at? It's as if we're treating it like just two distinct categories. On one side, you have all the abrupt rise times. Hammer striking strings, plucking the string, right? These are all going to end up being instantaneous, a mallet striking in time, okay? Um, uh, so you'll end up seeing, you know, piano and vibraphone uh, uh, all on, on kind of one side. Then on the other side, you'll end up uh, getting basically everything else. So listeners were essentially treating this, is this sound abrupt or not? There is nothing else going on. That's a very limiting piece of perceptual information. Okay? So maybe it acts like kind of a binary feature for us. It's all or none. I think of it as presence or absence of abruptness is what we're listening for. In this study, we didn't have it, right? Um, the second uh, thing that we looked at in this particular uh, demonstration was we also wanted to end up getting further into like the spectral envelope shape versus centroid. They said the centroid, or perception of brightness, is what people were actually using to understand uh, frequency information. But they're two different things. And when they're controlled for, there were hints in the literature from machine recognition studies, where they'd have computers try to end up identifying these sounds, that when you controlled for that information, you get different results. Uh, there's a term called sepstral coefficient that takes into account where the formants are when that was included the machines would do a much better job of labeling the instruments they were hearing than when they were just classifying them based on the centroid, which should give them brightness. So we said, let's just ask listeners to actually do this instead of just trusting what the computers say. Uh, so we ended up generating some stimuli where uh, a subset of this previous set that we were talking about, we used a low-pass filter to be able to move the centroids of a tone uh, to varying amounts. 
So we're changing the centroid systematically, even though it's still derived from the same instrument. These two uh, uh, depictions you're seeing down below, they should look almost the same to you, but one's filtered in the high frequency area, so we lost some high frequency energy there that was present over here. That was enough to move the centroid down slightly. Okay? Uh, so we did this systematically as, as a function of what the uh, instruments and the transforms were in the previous experiment, and went again, this time putting formant structure or the spectral envelope in contrast with the centroid itself. All right, so we'll go for the, here's our original violin, violin-like. Okay, and now here's with formant structure, which you heard before. Come out again. Oh, it's thinking. Where'd it go? I'll tell you what, let's go for the other one. See if that's any better. What do you think? St still string? Okay. Notice I just changed the spectral centroid to be consistent with the spectral centroid of the trombone and yet you're still hearing it as if it was in the string category. This should tell you how the experiment's going to go. When we gave this to them for discrimination, uh, you can end up seeing formant is at peak performance, ceilinged, right? Whereas the stuff for the spectral centroid, those variations didn't contribute nearly as much. It did get better as the differences got larger, like three steps on the right-hand side, uh, but still not uh, anywhere as good as what you got with the full envelope shape. So you're sensitive to all the peaks in the spectrum, not just an average of what's going on. Okay? Uh, and this is showing for identification when you ask them to label these things, they completely follow the formant structure. You should see it systematically change for anything labeled formant structure there as you go from one end of the, uh, the manipulation to the other, whereas in spectral centroid you should end up seeing it just leveled off, just a straight line. Okay? Even though we're changing the centroid to be more consistent with a different instrument, doesn't matter. They still hear it as itself, just like you would hear the filtered uh, telephone speech of a person as their voice as opposed to somebody else's. Okay, so now I have to revise what I originally put up there. What people had been talking about for a quarter of a century as being responsible for musical instrument timbre was the spectral centroid. They had, they had said that brightness is what you were responding to. Brightness is not what we were responding to. We're much more sensitive than that. We're picking up on where all the peaks are in frequency. Okay. And that should end up highlighting a lot of what's going to come after this. Um, so everybody with me so far? Any questions about this? If you got this, then everything else is going to end up falling in line. All right, yes? Does, um, one of the things for, for identification, the importance of the attack um, is very important. And so I guess it's more than just rise time. because. Um, I teach the acoustics course here, and one yeah. of the things I do is I have a trumpet and an oboe, and I splice the attack of one onto the other. Yeah, one of the things that ended up on the cutting room floor this morning was evidence of, of the attack contributing uh, uh, to identification performance. And uh, I would end up saying in here, you know, if anything, we're, we're just minimizing it because it's being treated in a binary way. We're in the realm where it should contribute less, but that does not mean it doesn't contribute at all. Right? So could it have affected things a little bit? Yeah, but it, it apparently, from the previous experiment, wasn't the difference in what they were calling uh, brass versus violin. Mm -hmm. So since we're working within the same tones, we feel like that's not what's responsible for what we're observing here. Okay. Right? Essentially, that's all controlled out. Right? We took it out. Right. So it could end up making things miserable for them, but it makes them equally miserable everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Good point. OK. So ultimately then uh, identification performance is going to end up reflecting some, some of these kind of basic acoustic differences that we seem to be sensitive to. Um, and uh, a lot of those are only going to end up showing up in kind of more extreme conditions where we push the limits of what people can categorize. Uh, what I'm suggesting here is that there's a lot of variation that we will accept and still consider it to be an example of that category, just not a good one. Okay. Uh, and ultimately, brightness is not what's driving things, right? The, the spectral envelope shape is, and that the very first paper in that area actually defined it that way, and it got twisted in the literature, right? And so, so this is a way of saying, well, don't treat those as the same, they're not. All right, the second example I'm going to end up giving you for a musical instrument study that has to do with this 
is saying, okay, well, how much of this envelope shape is necessary to end up driving uh, our categorization? So far, I've just had this nice smooth curve based on all the harmonics I'm, I'm providing you. But what if I started systematically eliminating that information? There's two ways actually to go about this. One that Jim had already done for me. Uh, he had smoothed out the spectrum. And if you smooth it enough, eventually it's going to be kind of flat or just fall off in a, in a direction. And people can't tell what the heck it is anymore. Okay? Uh, the other way to do this, though, is to actually systematically eliminate information everywhere except where the formants are supposed to be. And that's what we did. Is we decided to create a bunch of stimuli. I'm just highlighting the section in red that you can focus on here. That just focused on the, uh, what to do with the individual harmonics in certain regions of the spectrum. We could have all the harmonics, so resynthesize the tone where it has all of them. Seven harmonics, where we essentially go through and say, where are the peaks across this whole distribution of energy? We'll leave all of those alone, and anywhere else we'll end up eliminating. Okay? And then a four harmonic condition, this is really pressing the limits of acceptability. We're talking about tones that start with like 30, 40 harmonics. Now we're going to end up limiting it down to just four frequencies being presented. But they happen to end up falling right where the formants were for that instrument. Okay? Would that be enough for people to tell what's there? Okay, uh, this is showing it to you in, in a, a spectral kind of sideways view. Okay, so these are the individual harmonics. Down at the bottom we have one for all the harmonics for electric guitar sound. Uh, the middle is seven harmonics and the top is just four harmonics. Okay, question is, do you hear these things as themselves? All right, so let's, let's take one of these for an example. Come on, play. Media players not liking us today. Let's try this instead. Okay, so like like uh, more of a hammer striking a string. So that's probably a, a piano type example. Sound similar? Changed a little bit, right? But you can still get a lot of the characteristics coming out, and all the attack is still preserved. Okay. Um, so the question is, how would they label these things if we did this across several different instruments? We had six different instruments represented. Uh, we had them identify the instruments using like these icons that you see here. This is what the subject would end up seeing. Okay? And we also did discrimination ratings where instead of just saying, can you tell the difference, yes or no, we also had them assign a rating of how different they were uh, on this one to eight scale. So one to four represents same responses, but uh, four would be, yeah, same, but they're not really that close to each other. Okay, one would be they're identical. And eight would end up being this is as different as it gets night and day. Okay? The identification results look like this. Uh, uh, so one should be the maximum that, that you can end up seeing there. I just extended it so you can end up seeing, seeing the full bars. But uh, with all harmonics, performance tended to end up being pretty good for most instruments, not for all. Uh, saxophone was often being uh, confused with clarinet in this sample. Okay? Um, but you can end up seeing it's virtually perfect for trombone and, and vibraphone. Okay? With seven harmonics, for those particular instruments and clarinet as well, it's virtually unchanged. And with four harmonics, still uh, virtually unchanged. So we're eliminating tons of information that are actually present for the listener. And it's affecting identification, at least across this set of instruments, hardly at all. Okay? What should that tell you? It tells you you respond most to getting information where you need it. You don't need all the frequencies. You need the frequencies where the uh, resonances of the instrument are going to end up falling to categorize it. Now, to hear it sound beautiful, you would obviously want everything that it has to offer. But just to know what it was, you only need a few. Uh, this is looking at the rating task results. We could end up getting a, a multidimensional scaling solution from it. And look, you get this kind of bifurcation going on between uh, sets of instruments. Uh, it's really just looking at the four harmonic versus all harmonics in, in this particular task. And you can end up seeing, in all cases, the uh, corresponding version, the reduced version of the tone, is always close to the original. It's not like it completely changed categories on us all of a sudden. Okay? Uh, the dimensions also relate to spectral information. The, the first one seems to end up uh, relating to spectral irregularity, which is really where are the peaks in the, in the spectrum. 
Okay, so it's really a, a related form and structure. The other one is looking at spectral complexity really having to do with how many peaks. On the right hand side where uh, uh, you've got uh, trombone and then uh, on the left hand side at the top you've got the vibraphone. So on dimension two you can see they're kind of relatively high up in that dimension. They also happen to end up being the tones with, with relatively few harmonics and relatively few peaks in the spectrum. Okay. So, Timbre categorization then should be maintained as long as we have energy in the right place, where the resonance are for the original instrument. Okay? And, uh, and they're consistent with what Jim had found in his other methods, and uh, any shifts in uh, performance were actually uh, restricted to the instruments that had the biggest problems with being categorized in our sample in the first place. So if they had problems with with all the harmonics being there, then they're definitely going to have problems when we start removing some too. Okay, now what is this kind of like? I, I, I needed a segue to speech, so I threw one in here. This isn't, isn't from my work, though we've worked with some of these stimuli before. How would you liken sucking out all the harmonics of a musical instrument to something in speech? There's a demonstration called sine wave speech, where you could actually replace all the harmonics in, in the human speech signal with just a series of frequencies that are based on where the formant energy really is. It's not even harmonic energy, so it's just following along with where the intense energy is in the spectrum. And if, if, if we play a three-tone sample to people, it looks kind of like this. Uh, the question is, what do you hear it as? Where were you a year ago? Where were you a year ago? So this is the original. Where were you? That's Bob Remez, who is the one who introduced this. Uh, but notice we've gotten rid of tons of energy, and yet you were, you, it certainly didn't sound like a human producing it. But meanwhile, you're still able to end up telling that that was speech. I would say it's based on the same principles that we were just talking about with the musical case. Okay? Um, so the speech example I'm going to tell you about today is looking at a, at a slightly different prediction to come from source filter theory then it's going to end up saying that, well, we've spent a lot of time focusing on formants being important for speech because that's all speech researchers for the last half a century plus have really focused on for understanding what speech is. Say, well, you filter it this particular way, you hear it as a speech sound. You notice when I played you the original tone coming from your vocal folds, it just sounded like a bus, right? So that's really what they've concentrated on. There's lots of evidence that we can end up talking about. I just cited a few classic examples here, okay? But what about the source characteristics? What about what's going on with the vocal folds? How does that interact with the filter? It's not responsible by itself, but it's going to modify which frequency kind of information is allowed to come out because it's what you start with. Okay? Nobody's really looked much at that other than the folks that I listed here. Rosalind Liberman had actually looked at uh, just changing the fundamental frequency, the lowest frequency in the series. If what you're producing at the vocal folds are integer multiples of that frequency, then if we go up, what's happening to the distribution of harmonics? Right now, my voice is producing a fundamental frequency of about 100 hertz. That means I'm producing 100, 200, 300, 400, up through about 5,000 hertz. If I change that to 300, uh, first you'd be alarmed because you'd be thinking I'd either uh, have hurt myself badly or I'd be going back through puberty. Okay, but once you got past that, you know, what, what would we say is going on about the distribution of harmonic energy? 300, then 600. I just skipped 300 hertz, whereas before I was just dealing with a separation of 100 hertz between these harmonics. Now the filter is acting independently of this, and it's imposing where the peaks in the spectrum should be. Those harmonics, if I'm talking about 300 hertz, could completely miss where the foreman is supposed to be. What should that do to identification performance for whatever sound I was making? Should drive that sucker down, right? And so uh, Ros and Limmerman did a study where they, they showed as they increased fundamental frequency, performance got worse. So that's consistent with that claim. Uh, and they thought, well, it's just because spectral sampling was weak. We had fewer harmonics to work with. We say, no, it has to be energy in the right place. It's not just the sampling. It's where you're sampling it from, because we got away with four harmonics in the last study I was showing you, right? So we wanted to end up doing a study that would end up looking at that in a different way. We looked at harmonicity. 
violating the harmonic relationship between adjacent frequencies in the series. Shown in red here, I, I've, I've taken uh, one harmonic and just shifted it over to the right from where it should end up being in the distribution. See how it's not equally spaced with all the other harmonics? If a formant was supposed to happen right where it used to be, then that should end up impacting performance, even though it's still considered part of the same sound. Okay? Uh, my student Chris Becker ended up uh, doing an initial study of that using five valves distributed across uh, the graph that you see here in F1 and F2 space. Um, and had people label them, uh, and, uh, and it was all uh, while they, he was se separately mistuning the harmonic that def kind of fell on the first two formants. He would move them in a similar direction, either positive in frequency or negative in frequency, away from perfect tuning in systematic steps. He has five of them there labeled in, in terms of uh, percentage steps. And this is what happened. The, this the only real effect that came out of that work is that it, when, he, when he drove them downward in frequency uh, by 5%, uh, performance got significantly worse. All right. Now that's not, not a, a, a one to end up like jumping off the rooftops with excitement about. You know, you say, well, it's really a limited effect. It's only happening in one spot. So we went back to the drawing board. This is uh, work I did with uh, Lilia Scari. Uh, where we now looked at a broader range of fundamental frequency. In Chris's study, he only had one fundamental frequency, and it was low, consistent with what uh, a male speaker would do. That should end up minimizing the effect of this mistuning because all the harmonics are close together. Okay. The redo that we did now said, let's, let's take a whole bunch of fundamental frequencies and let's start with a broader distribution to make it a little harder for people. So start at 220, and we went up to 321 hertz in the last experiment. You may notice it says experiment three up there. I left that there for posterity's sake, just to let you know there are two other experiments before we got it right, okay? Uh, so if you want to end up hearing about those, we had to end up losing something for time. Just know they exist and we can end up talking about them later. Um, but that 321 hertz, most of you, uh, I hope all of you, aren't going around producing fundamental frequencies of 321 hertz. This, we refer to this as the kind of chip, chipmunkizing kind of condition. You know, put it, put it in Alvin in the chipmunk's territory. That's what we're doing th with the voice, right? So that's an extreme case up there. Uh, we had two vowels, but this time we designed the vowels so instead of just being across a broad range, we, we manipulated the uh, mistuning so that it was moving toward what the other vowel would specify. So when people would label it wrong, it should turn into the other vowel, and that way we could tell what we were doing. Okay? So it's learning from our mistakes. We also included a goodness of fit rating. In case the identification didn't change, we could still tell whether the quality was changing as a result of it. And so here's what the results are in a nutshell for the experiment. On the left-hand side is the identification performance. On the right-hand side are goodness ratings about how good they were as examples of those vowels. And uh, the first thing you'll end up seeing from the uh, legend here, as fundamental frequency changes, if fundamental frequency was all that was driving this, you would have expected systematic changes as we go from 220 to 321. If you look at this, you can end up seeing they mix together a little bit, right? At 321, is 321 starting to end up driving a little worse in some instances? Yes, it should. It's really high in frequency, and we could have completely missed the formant. But it, just because we're moving up in frequency doesn't mean that the spread of harmonics is going to cause us problems. It's where they happen to relate to the formants themselves. Okay? The mistuning, however, uh, started to end up showing some systematic differences. As the mistuning from perfect harmonics on the left-hand side to it says 15 and 30 mils, that's getting kind of further mistuned. The one that's labeled R is where we just lost the harmonic completely. We just figured that would be another way to just completely pluck it out of there, uh, just in case the mistuning was getting too broad that they were hearing it segregate out as if it was an interfering sound. And it turns out that that really killed performance, right? So if we're losing energy from the place that we needed it, now our, our vowel identification performance tanked. Same thing was happening in goodness ratings, so these, these are kind of mirror results, and you see uh, kind of the quality of that vowel goes down as mistuning goes up. Okay, so what can we conclude? We rely on information at formant peaks. So far, it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about musical instrument sounds or whether I'm talking about speech, you can treat them as some of what analogous conditions. Okay, uh, the main difference being in speech, you have the luxury of being able to move your articulators all the time, whereas for acoustic instruments, you have one fixed set of resonances to deal with, so it's static, okay? 
um, the fundamental frequency is going to affect perception, but it's only going to affect perception to the degree where the energy doesn't fall right on the form at peaks. Um, so we should be able to expect similar results with all sorts of things. Yeah? I'm curious with your data, if you can go back just yeah. more. Is that an interaction? So as the fundamental frequency went up in this time from on a or if I'm uh, as the fundamental frequency went up and, and the mistuning interacted with it, yeah. Yeah, I think like I'm, I'm looking down here to end up seeing if that, if that came out. Um, yeah, I believe, I believe there was. There certainly was if you look in specific vowel conditions. Yeah. So, so it wasn't systematic across, uh, across both vowels. There was an interdependency upon those things, right? And what that means, it's a good question. Right? Right? Minimally, though, we know mistuning is going to affect things. And, and where the fundamental frequency affects things, we'd have to end up like looking at the direct relationship between where the frequencies fall for every harmonic now. It, that's what makes this a really complex picture. Okay. The last thing I wanted to end up talking to you about today is like if, if we're doing all these kind of psychoacoustic manipulations, we have to have some way of accomplishing that. And uh, th that took me down another realm a, a few years back uh, that was all focused on development of software for use in this research. But I also wanted to end up doing something that was a little more flexible than just uh, designing something for stimuli. And so uh, the first software application uh, I wanted to talk about was essentially the result of a bet I had with Jim Beauchamp. Uh, you know, I told him, I think formants, this was several years ago, mind you, I said, before I've run any of these studies, I said, I think formant structure is where it's at. I think that's what, what's really driving the most important thing. And, and he says, really? You know, you, you think you can end up, because he was doing very complex resynthesis of sounds that sounded perfect. And uh, I said, yeah, just for identifying it, I think yeah, I can get away with just like a series of a few filters and people be able to reliably determine what that thing is. And he said, yeah, I don't buy that. I, so, so we had a little bet going. Uh, I still haven't collected. I, I need to end up tracking that man down. Um, but uh, so I said, the only way that I can end up doing this to make a device that would end up allowing me to end up filtering it in the way that I want. Uh, my general wishes as a psychoacoustician, this is actually going back to my grad school days. I said, why don't we just have a device that's simple? You know, if I, if I want amplitude to ramp at a certain time, I can end up doing that. Uh, have different types of oscillators, so sawtooth waves for speech type stuff or pulse waves, right? And then uh, square waves for, for uh, synthesis of, of some brass sounds, for example. Uh, we want precision, though, and uh, controlling the number of harmonics, the tuning exactly of the fundamental frequency, et cetera. Okay. In speech sense, uh, it turns out it's hard to end up like, like removing all the effects of articulatory constraints. Uh, there's, uh, the best example that's used a lot in research, and we use it a lot in the lab too in our speech studies, is, is Pratt. This is free software available on the internet, developed by academics and, and continuing uh, to be developed by academics. So it's really good stuff. The problem is that a lot of what it does is hidden behind the scenes. So when you say, I want it to do this thing, when you look at the acoustic results, you realize it's doing a lot more than what you asked it to do because it's doing it on the, the natural constraints that are imposed in the speech production process. What I'm doing, I just want to end up saying, change this amplitude at this point. Right? Uh, recently, we, we actually had uh, one where we were just trying to alter the frequency of a sine wave. And when we gave Pratt the instructions to end up doing that, it, imp it imposed additional frequencies beyond the ones that were originally there. Not good, right? To end up turning a simple sound into a complex sound. Okay? Uh, academic tone synthesizers, on the other hand, uh, tended to end up like just going for duplicating the sound exactly. Uh, musicians want the sound the way they want it, right? And, and that means give it to me in all its natural complexity. And so Jim has actually devoted most of his uh, 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 later career to developing software tools to do that. SoundDan is an example of that where he can end up using uh, uh, vocoder resynthesis and additive synthesis to end up getting it exactly right, okay? So it's beautiful sounding stuff, but not what I need for my research purposes. Uh, commercial synthesizers you know, that musicians use uh, have a lot of capabilities, but uh, they tend to end up having too few filters. Uh, musicians have gotten fascinated in the analog synthesizer days, which are now coming back again for some reason. We're reliving the 60s in, in synthesizer sounds. But it's, a lot of that's based on one filter. Notice a lot of the stuff we were talking about earlier, there are several spectral peaks. How are you going to represent that with one filter? You can't. 
right? Uh, whereas in speech, you have six filters, minimally, six bandpass filters that are, that are accomplishing the sound that you get. So I wanted at least that many. Uh, this one here uh, is the best example that I could end up thinking of is like a really nice sounding example uh, called Alchemy. It's showing with uh, down at the bottom here three different filters. These are formant filters, thankfully. They actually thought of formant, right? Uh, but the reason they thought of formants is because this uh, synthesis engine was developed by Kelly Fitz, whose uh, mentor happened to be Jim Beauchamp, right? So, so there's a lineage there. Uh, but it's good for what it does, not simple enough for us. And, and, and not enough filters either, okay? Well, so what I decided to do is like borrow from the speech literature. On the left hand side is, is showing you uh, different filtering that goes on in, in speech synthesizers, this classic 1980 CLAT synthesizer. And it has two parts, one a sequence of filters up at the top. This would end up being for uh, vocal uh, sources, your vibrational sounds. The bottom one though is it's showing the same kind of filters in parallel with each other. This is typically done for noise sources in speech uh, uh, resynthesis, okay? Uh, I was caring about that because if you do it in parallel, you cannot get rid of all the high frequency energy that would normally be present in the sound. So I wanted to rip off just that parallel branch of the speech synthesizer. On the right hand side here is a, a monosynth called the Lil Fatty. It was Bob Moog's last synthesizer before he passed. Okay, he was working on that when he died. And, uh, and this is one where, where basically it could end up having subtractive synthesis, meaning you can end up having like a lot, uh, like a filtering out of, of high frequency information. Uh, if you want. So, I, but it's musical, and so I want to combine the musical capabilities of that with the filter structure, the speech synthesizer. So really, put the clat synthesizer together with the little fatty, what do you get? I'm looking for a little clatty. Okay, that's what I'm trying to make. And so, this is a software synthesizer that we built uh, a form function, and uh, this is the interface for it that you're seeing at the top. Uh, has, is built like any other subtractive synthesizer. It has oscillators on, on the left. The filter section in the middle is what's really different. All those green boxes there in the middle is, is where all the action's happening. And it's a series of bandpass filters like you would get in a speech synthesizer in parallel to be able to mimic anything, okay? Um, it's also a monosynth that could be played using a, like an electronic MIDI keyboard, and so it actually becomes like a, a, a new kind of uh, virtual instrument. Okay. When is it available? Huh? It it it, it well it exists now. Uh, we just got approval. This uh, got an innovation award at JMU last year, and I'm essentially just waiting for the web development to finish to be able to end up uh, uh, like putting it out there for people. Okay. Uh, so the hope is that we just end up delivering this to like for a, a student-based laboratory donation, you know, to go to help support students who are working on these projects, like somewhere on the order of like eight, ten dollars, that researchers just could just grab that and help get them to travel to conferences. Okay, um, so hopefully that'll end up being up within the next couple of months. Okay, um, we developed this in, the, in Max for Live. Max is is actually. A, uh, it's academically based, to, uh, it's a programming language that's object oriented that allows people to make audio or visual devices that don't otherwise exist. And uh, that thing has now been transferred to, ported to be able to end up fitting inside of Ableton Live, which is the same environment that DJs use to end up being able to run their DJ sets off of. So essentially all the things that apply in Ableton Live with audio manipulation could then be added on after the fact beyond whatever we created in Max. So it's basically putting a program inside of a program, okay? Here's the basic architecture of the synthesizer. You have sound source. Uh, I show several oscillators in there, including noise. Um, it's actually got a section of it, though, where you can end up adding in any user-specified waveform. So I could save anything out as a wave file and import that as a starting point. Okay. Then the filters in the middle is where the action happens. So you see six bands that are showing up there as, as filters. Uh, that'll end up really determining what should end up being the unique characteristic of that instrument or speech sound we're trying to end up mimicking. Uh, this is just showing the, uh, a little bit of the parameters, the oscillator section, including the user uh, waveforms at the bottom. You can select this from a menu. You just shove a bunch of wave files in one folder and we can end up going and grabbing them and using them now. Okay pass them through a series of filters that we have complete control over down to the level of the individual hertz. Um, 
We also added in just for fun the thing called the fattener over there. That's, that's an effect section for, for musicians to use. Obviously, we wouldn't use this in a psychoacoustic experiment, so we saved out a version without that, that little section. But it makes a lot more fun noises, right? Um, this is the, uh, uh, an accompanying program called Source Builder, where now we can design what the oscillators are. And you're just looking at like a simple uh, sawtooth wave here. Uh, you control how many harmonics uh, on uh, and where those frequencies are. This is how we mistuned harmonics in that previous speech study. Uh, what the amplitude of the harmonics is, what the phases are. Uh, you can actually hand draw these things if you want, or at the bottom I'm showing you like another picture that shows just text values. You could actually create this as an Excel spreadsheet of, of numeric values and port them in there and uh, just cut and paste and it'll end up working. Okay, it's a text box. Um, this is the uh, a glimpse of a patching environment so you could actually click on on the interface and it'll open up the program immediately so you can make modifications to it and so the idea is once we release this thing we're hoping that people will be able to end up making it do whatever they want yeah, leave it open. huh leave it open. yeah yeah leave, leave it open <laughs> yeah we, we will do that um, all right give you a couple of examples so here's simplified instruments uh, based on a, a, a violin that's with a, a little bit of effect. You know, brass sound. Okay, more clarinet. That's a little flute, it's just adding some noise. A mallet based instrument. Okay, and there's some speech stuff. So it's like harmonizing with itself. Right, so it could do a little whisper. And if we stick the whole thing together with some effects added for fun, so this is showing how you can end up sticking some of Ableton's things in there, then you get like a more elaborate musical instrument. I apologize in advance for, for the performance because that's, that's just me fiddling around on keys. That's technically still one note at a time, even though it's, it's creating the harmonies for that. At least sound different from other things that you've heard as synthesizers before, a little bit. Okay, same principles, just more filters. All right. The last thing I wanted to end up uh, alluding to, just to wrap up, do I have two minutes to do this? Okay, because you know those two minutes include Mike Gordon, right? <laughs> um, the last thing I wanted to end up talking about is like we've done a series of other applications. Um, we've been asked uh, by some colleagues to end up also applying these kind of uh, uh, designs of new devices to other problems. And I'm just listing a few of them here. So we've, we've actually been asked by the Army Research Laboratory in, in Aberdeen, Maryland to be able to end up uh, designing and testing a gunshot simulator. I can tell you more about it, but of course I might have to kill you after I inform you of that information. Um, <laughs> No, we've shared that information publicly, but, uh, uh, but suffice it to end up saying that the same principles that we talked about with formant structure and how it, things are filtered are actually applying even to something that's like a quick noise-based thing like that. Okay? We also resynthesized dolphin calls for a researcher that is, that's studying animal communication. He, he wanted something that sounded more natural, so he sent us some, some samples. We read about like, what kinds of filtering happens in the dolphin's head as it makes a call. And it's actually a very simple set of filters in order to do it. It's only like one or two filters gets the whole job done. It sounds, sounds really realistic. Okay. And then lastly, we're applying the same idea to skull resonances now. Yeah. Sorry, just that's realistic to a human or to a dolphin? Uh, it real, it, it, the human hears it as a dolphin call. So it sounds very similar to the recorded call, even though it's being recreated moment to moment. Okay. Uh, whether the dolphin treats it as real is anybody's guess. Right? But that's one of the things he's going to do is now he has a way that he could systematically manipulate these things to see what dolphins do with it. Um, 
Lastly, we, uh, I, I got to talking about research that Mike presented at a conference I organized called AFCAM uh, each year, and, and uh, he had found some uh, uh, correspondences initially that were interesting between where a person's uh, skull resonances were versus uh, like the, uh, the, what you would hear as the pitches, the dominant pitches, in musical excerpts. Okay, so if they corresponded, they actually liked the sound of that recording a little bit better. Okay, and uh, you know the question is, well, you know, is there a better way that we can end up testing that out? I had suggested to him, well, why don't you manipulate each tone to match a person's skull resonances? And so we took about doing that, trying to end up measuring where those skull resonances were, and then modifying what we get. And it's really just a source filter example. The sound. Is, is now being conveyed through the skull, which is going to end up reinforcing some frequencies and attenuating others. Uh, what I'm showing that's actually being partially blocked here, thank you very much. Okay, if you look at this graph here, you can end up seeing just little hints of the, in that blue line. There are several peaks in the spectrum. We were passing noise, white noise that's completely flat across the spectrum, uh, conducting it through the bone, uh, being picked up from the skull, and you can end up seeing certain peaks will end up showing up in the spectrum. Uh, we took that information and subjected it to a series of filters that we now, uh, peak filters where we just add energy in certain frequency regions. And uh, uh, that's what uh, you're seeing as devices over there. Uh, when you do that for different people, you get a completely different sound out. And I'm betting that it sounds good to you sometimes and not good to you other times. So let's check it out. Uh oh. So that's the original. Here's a comparison. Here it's not as bright, right? And all, some low frequencies are, are getting reinforced. Here's based on a different person. Hear how you're getting some, some frequencies that are really getting kicked into overdrive there? All right, so this would predict then that, that if, if we present them to the people whose skulls these actually came from, one of two things could happen. Either they love it because it's reinforcing frequencies that they normally like to reinforce, or alternatively, because we added energy in that region, it might make them hate it, right? Because their own skull is already augmenting that thing, and we just augmented it even further, right? And, and, and that's what seems, in the preliminary stuff we're getting, that's what seems to be happening. Uh, that's what I'm going to spend my afternoon hopefully looking at, okay? Um, so then the suggestion would be we could end up testing it again by actually just sucking out the energy in those spots and go again to end up finding it like a correction for what our skull does so that we actually end up hearing the sounds the way they were intended when they were recorded. Okay? Um, to wrap up then, the source filter model, I hope I've made a good case for you thinking of this like a general conception that applies to all sorts of sound sources uh, and, and how we recognize it. And then currently, we're, we're also looking further into the idea of, like I mentioned, fundamental frequency before. We're actually doing a, a, a study that's looking at fundamental frequency effects in more predictive fashion. So this complicated question that you were t tipping into, Mike, you know, of saying, exactly where should we predict that we're missing the formants for that particular instrument or that particular speech sound, we should be able to know exactly where performance should fail. And this would end up making a, a very strong case for, for uh, source characteristics playing a role. So I think that's all I have. So thanks for listening. If, if I didn't eat up all the time, I'd like to take a few questions. All right. So questions you guys might have. Yes? Uh, restoration of the missing fundamental? Right. Every, everybody hears what? Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and, and that's the way, the phenomenon of the missing fundamental, folks, if you don't know, is like you, you take the fundamental uh, uh, frequency out of the sound, but all the harmonics are actually integer multiples of it, and you actually hear the pitch in the same place. Right? Whereas early pitch theories actually said it should displace higher. Uh, it's funny you should bring that up because uh, just this past week I was actually doing uh, page proof re readings on the interaction between pitch and, and timbre based on missing fundamental stimuli that we f filtered afterwards. Okay? Uh, what we essentially had done is we said, well, a lot of people won't label it as the same pitch. Usually these are non-musicians who can't tell the difference between changes in brightness, which are ordered low to high, like we were talking about earlier, and so is pitch, it's ordered low to high, right? So people just know something's changing about the spectrum that I'm hearing. If we filtered though, uh, low pass filtered to end up getting rid of some high frequency energy so that the centroid moves right back where it originally was before you took the fundamental out, people will end up uh, discriminating those pitches the same way that they did originally when the fundamental was in there. So it would suggest that, that uh, a certain subset of listeners are actually responding to brightness in that situation. Will it impact the timbre? Absolutely. Will it impact the timbre str as strongly as we were talking about in these examples? Only if it falls on where a formant was. Yeah. Um, it was interesting that Gary brought up um, the issues of the attack. Um, and I was wondering if you have the data of the, the various uh, subsets of the subjects and what their listening experiences are from someone who seldom listens to music to someone who's an intense listener to someone who's a musician to somebody who might be an audio engineer and have mm -hmm. even a different angle on it because like Gary and I probably have an acuity uh, I would su suspect that that exceeds even a lot of musicians that, that you know yeah, there, there, is, there is a researcher phenomenon that goes on in this that anybody who spends time in an auditory perception lab uh, gathers a lot more detail because they're spending their whole lives doing analytic listening to these right. things, right? So, so I, yeah, so I would suspect that that would happen. I don't have it based on walk of life. What I do have is I, I have a bunch of data from musical history questionnaires we give them that t ask them, how much musical training do you have? What variety of musical training I'd do you have? Which instruments are they? I'd love to see a meta-analysis of that because when Gary's concerns about the attack not being quite the issue for us, we, I mean, it's a major portion of our perceptive knowledge, especially Gary's a percussionist primarily, right, the, the initially, and like just the choice of a, a vibraphone mallet uh, could change that, the first few milliseconds of sound, and it's a big deal for us. Yeah, so I, what I'd suspect if I had to guess what would happen is performance would end up being better than the average person. Uh, for somebody who has such training, uh, but you'd probably also sh show the kind of same tendency where uh, there's a clustering of performance broken by around the abrupt sounds versus the non-abrupt sounds. And, and there is, for very basic perceptual tendencies anyway, the longer the, the time delay you're talking about, the, the worse your discrimination is going to be anyway. It's systematic that way, that you need more, more time separation to hear a difference as you go further out to slower attacks. Yeah, and, a lot, and a lot of this stuff was I mean, pretty much handled by the famous synthesizer players going back into the 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, with the analog, the, the difficulty of analog machines compared to today, the old, the old subtractive machines. And I mean, the band like Weather Report play something that's horn-like, you just put a real horn on top of it, and then it sounds like a section. Yeah, yeah, what's really nasty, as soon as you get into ensemble playing, then, then all you're really doing is matching uh, uh, intensity wherever the peak of intensity is. And so a lot of information about like what the length of the attack is and which like note may have been triggered first, all of that's being lost anyway. Yeah. Last question, folks. I oh, know we oh yeah, one back, yeah. So um, if you think of copyright that um, have a limited number of yeah, if, if the goal, most of the time, the goal in that cochlear implant situation is just to improve identification of the sounds that people need for basic communication and function, right? And so you can get away with, you know, inform relatively few frequencies. Or frequencies that will be... 
And, and in the case of speech, if that's what the real focus tends to be, right, then you don't even need to end up going in particularly high frequency ranges in order to accomplish that, right? And well, with communication, there's a little redundancy in the signal and all that, but you know, that means then that possibly cochlear implant wearers can enjoy music. You can do fine with for harmonics. Right, it, it, it'd be like a simplified version of these tones, but at least they'd be able to end up hearing differences between the instruments reliably that way. Yeah. Uh, on that note, I was about to ask uh, with regard to the cochlear implant, uh, when they implant uh, the electrodes from basal end of the cochlear to the apex, so we are starting from high frequency to the low frequency. For some reason, if they cannot implant the Yeah, get past the first turn of the cochlea, they'll get stuck are missing. They are missing, say for example, head frequency sound. That's then, a much bigger limitation. If they are listening through the cochlear implant, there will be a lot of gaps, which is going to be very annoying. What they have done in that mm -hmm. speech processor, uh, it is the concept of uh, frequency transposition. Taking the high frequency whenever it is, they know that the individual cannot hear, take that low uh, high frequency and move to the middle frequency. So they will not have any gap of that perception so they can... Yeah, as long as they're doing that in a logarithmic way, it should still have like some communication significance to them, right? But yeah, it's a big problem that the, the, these cochlear implants, if you can't get past the first turn in the cochlea, you just l missed out on like what are typically the most intense peaks that we listen to, which means it's the most valuable information for distinguishing these, these sounds. So with respect to those of you who have questions and such, we appreciate your coming, but we will tend to talk now. Michael will be around for a little bit longer if you want to talk to him. But thank you all for coming. Thanks, Michael.